second reading, it's a little long. So relax, listen to the word of God that is read to you. And that's from 1 Kings. Chapter 2, verses 10 and 12. Then David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. He had reigned 40 years over Israel, seven years in Hebron, and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his rule was firmly established. So then it moves to chapter three, Verses 3 through 14. And this is pretty long. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David. Except that he offered sacrifices and burnt incense on high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices so that there was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar at Gibeon. The Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want of me, I will give it to you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you, unrighteous and upright in heart. You have continued his great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in places of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, people too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had not asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourselves, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never be anyone like you, nor will there be ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for both riches and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes and commandments as David your father did, I will give you a long life. The word of the Lord. says, David, he did his thing, but God forgave him. So what Solomon, who was one of his 
David's son. God says to him, listen, ask for what you want, Lord God. He says, all I want is wisdom so I can judge this great people of yours. He didn't say my people. He says your people. You know this in the scripture. Solomon didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for fame. He asked for wisdom. Here's my one-liner. Why didn't they play cards or on the ark? Because Noah was standing on the deck. And he couldn't play cards. See, every time I talk here, I'm going to bring one of those little one-liners. One of the joys of birthdays and Christmas is the receiving of gifts. Everyone enjoys having their brightly wrapped gifts to open. Perhaps we'll shake the package to guess what's in it. Or perhaps we have no clue and are totally surprised. See, Solomon did not have that problem with God. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5, we read, Yahweh appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give you. Now when God asks what we want, we don't have to worry about limitations. See, God's question to Solomon is a version of what I believe is life's most important question. What do you want? The question gets to the heart of, of our deepest desire and ambitions. What do you want? So if God were to address us today and say, ask what I should give you, how would we respond if you could ask for help, wealth, have a long life because most of us aren't working. So what we're left with, give us that long life, Lord. What do we want? What would we ask God for? Our passage begins with a very brief summary of the transition of the kingdom from David to Solomon. We know how that goes. We just had an election, but we know how the transition goes. Most of us are pretty familiar with both of these names. So it is easy for us to assume that the transition was smooth and painless. But in fact, it was far from that. David had more than one son who wanted the throne after his death. Absalom did not want to wait until David died. Absalom was David's son. He mounted an all ill-fated campaign to take, him, take over the king, the kingdom, while David was still alive. Now, I remember last week, uh, the pastor did mention a little insert, excerpt about Absalom, who got killed. Uh, Joab, who was a general of the army, had three da darts faced into his heart. That didn't kill him. However, Joab had 10 of his soldiers that killed Absalom. But Solomon didn't arrive in this coronation without trouble. In fact, he had to eliminate several key peoples. Bef 
before he could solidify his grasp on power. Joab had to be killed, that I just mentioned, who is the general, and Shimei, who had once cursed David, was also killed. And there was Solomon's brother, Adonijah, who was his main rival to the throne. He also had to be killed. And he took the help from the new reigns of the prophet Nathan and his mother, Bathsheba, that's Solomon's mother, to make sure that Solomon was the future king. So when we read our passage today, let us not be lured into thinking that Solomon <clears throat> was an innocent young lad who stepped in quietly after David's death. All these stories are filled with intrigue, plotting, and even violence. Several people got killed. His brother won the throne, was his main rival. But this glory background is not even hinted at in our passage in 1 Kings. Instead, we see here a pious young man who seeks to be the same type of devout, beloved king his father was. Most of us remember Solomon only for these early stories about his wisdom and from the fact that he was one who would eventually build the temple that David, his father, as king had planned. Though Solomon's reign was filled with outward success, it was also characterized, listen to this, by idolatrous worship. It is no accident that the kingdom divides and began the descent into destruction at the end of Solomon's reign. It is a sad commentary on his ineffectiveness. Solomon's main shortcomings was his habit of worshiping in high places, prior to the construction of the temple in Jerusalem. High places were an acceptable place of worship, but Solomon would later build high places for his wives, his foreign gods, and in fact, made sacrifices there himself. The other problem Solomon had was the heavy taxes he laid on his people. Putting his people into forced labor, which I consider is a part of slavery. You know, these are his own people, it's not like some other nation, he brought them as slaves. His building projects were spectacular. But the cost of the people, to the people was high. They resented the heavy burden Solomon placed on them. So his raid was not success successful as we might expect. Our story finds Solomon at one of these high places in Gibeon. As often happens, God comes to Solomon while he's sleeping. God says, ask what I shall give you. And in verse of our text, 6 through 9, Solomon recounts the steadfast love God has shown to his father David then he protested, I'm only a little child. However, there was some debate about how old Solomon was at this point. Finally, Solomon says, finally, Solomon says to God, give your servant, therefore, an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this, your great people? See, Solomon, this 
said this was my people, that this is God's people. So you give me that discerning heart so I can decide, use my wisdom to judge between good and evil. The solution to Solomon's problem as a young man suddenly on the throne of his father's kingdom is to pray to God for wisdom. That's what Solomon wanted. This is the first biblical passage to introduce this theme which will become the hallmark of Solomon's reign. The remaining account of his monarchy is peppered with stories of how Solomon's wisdom made him world famous beyond anyone's wildest dreams. But everything that Solomon did, he was famous. God loved him. It pleases God that Solomon had not asked for long life, riches, or the destructions of his enemies. So God gave him wisdom. Then God adds, I will give you what which that you have not asked. See, God says, I'm going to give you things that you didn't ask for. Then God adds, I have already given you that which you have not asked, both riches and honor, so, there, so that there shall not be any among the kings like you. All of your days. Meaning past kings and present. See, David was the first king of Israel. And this is what God wants. God says, I'm going to give you all this. I'll give you the world. I'll give you riches. I'll give you honor. I'll give you conquer your enemies. But I want something to return. You know, God doesn't give us all this beautiful world without something in return. And God doesn't ask for much. This is what God is asking Solomon. And this is all I want. If you will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked. You see, he's not asking God. Or he says, walk in my ways, keep my commandments, obey me. And then this is what God says. Then I will lengthen your days. That reminds me of Romans chapter 10, verses 9. Jesus didn't ask for a lot. All Jesus wants, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised this Jesus from the dead, we shall be saved. And Jesus is not asking for a lot either. Same comparison. That's all you got to do, folks. See, Socrates and hundreds of other philosophers would presume wisdom as well. Socrates was a Greek philosopher. There were lots of them. Socrates' most famous line was, the unexamined life is not worth living. But we all, he also said, the only true wisdom is knowing you know nothing. <laughs> we know nothing. 17th century writer James Howell puts it simple. Some are wise, and some are otherwise. <laughs> Our one-time president, way back when, maybe some of us remember, Calvin Coolidge once said, some people are suffering from the lack of work, some from the lack of water, and many more from the lack of wisdom. A study of these people through the ages have been considered wise will clearly show that spirituality is the key ingredient to becoming wise. What does it take to make a person wise like that? 
Solomon let us know that we must go to God and ask for those qualities. James chapter 1, verses 5. If any one of you lacks wisdom, let them ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without approach, and it will be given unto him. Solomon became very wise and spawned the wisdom literature of the Bible. These are sections of the Bible that are devoted to telling us how to live. Wisdom literature includes some of the Psalms, Proverbs, and the book of James in the New Testament. See, our text today only goes up to 14. Well, I'm going to bring in 16, which shows Solomon uses his wisdom. And this is what Solomon did. There were two women, both prostitutes, living together and had babies about the same time. One of the women at night rolled over and killed her child, suffocated. She secretly went over to the other mother and exchanged the baby. So now she got the other woman's baby, which is alive, and the other woman has her dead child. The woman got up in the morning and says, this is the, 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 the woman that had the real child. Oh. Upon examination, this is not my child. Many mothers know that. I mean, you can look at your child. I'm not a mother. But for most of us who are mothers, you can be telling This is not my child. Mm -hmm. So they had their little confrontation. And the other one, oh, this is my child. So what they decide to do, we'll go to the king. Let him decide whose child this is. So they went to Solomon. And Solomon heard their story. And the first thing Solomon says, Bring me a sword. Have someone split this child in two. So either mother can have hair. <laughs> so the woman, child that died, that woman says, I don't care. Go ahead, cut the child in two. But the real mother, the real mother says, no, Solomon, I prefer to have this child stay alive, even if it takes to have another mother. So, that's Solomon wisely knew who the real mother was. You know, you're not going to give up the child. So what he did, he says, let's kill this child. Then we'll determine who the real mother was. See, if Solomon had so much wisdom, we which should certainly learn from him. If a man like Solomon were to write a book today, it would have been an instant bestseller, seller, and very impossible to get a hands and get a copy, get your hands a copy. Solomon comments after, if you think climbing the ladder is great, but it's not so. There is always someone above you. So everything we do, there's always someone above you. Whether when you used to work, your boss, the manager, and of course God is always above us. The best thing is to seek first God's kingdom. And all these, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you. The thing that matters the most in life is genuine wisdom. And remember what Jesus said about how to keep his commandments of God. He said, we are to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. He's not talking about the guy next door, the gal across the street. 
are the one that lives behind us. He's talking about the people of the world. We should love our neighbors as ourselves. That's one of his commandments to us. And people of God, that is real wisdom. Amen.